Welcome back to Paper Things. Today we'll be reading chapters 11 through 15. Chapter 11, Airplanes. Sasha has church on Sunday morning at 10, so Gage and Chloe come for me right after breakfast. Briggs is away until tomorrow, so they've had the studio all to themselves. I feel a splash of warmth as we burst out the door of Sasha's apartment building onto the sidewalk. The sun is shining, the snow is melting. It's one of those end of March days in Maine that feel like a present. A little reminder that spring is here, even if the warm days don't really arrive and stay for about two more months. My language arts teacher would call this day foreshadowing, I think. Foreshadowing spring. Too bad I don't get extra credit for knowing that. I reached down to pick up a penny, determined to make up the 14 cents I gave away on Friday. What are you going to buy with all that money, asks Chloe, who knows about my daisy piggy bank at Briggs. An apartment, <laughs> Chloe laughs. She's not kidding, says Gage, bending to pick up what we think is a nickel, but turns out to be a souvenir coin of some sort. Neat, but worthless. He chucks it aside. Not the rent, I clarify. But once Gage gets a steady job and we find an apartment, I can help out with stuff like shampoo and toilet paper and toothpaste. Yeah, then you can stop using mine, Chloe says as she bumps shoulders with Gage. We both know she's kidding, but I still steal a glance at Gage's face to see if his pride is hurt. It looks like it would take a lot more than a little teasing today to bring my brother down. When we get to the playground near Briggs, I ask Gage if I can stay a while. The place can be a treasure trove of dropped coins from adults chasing their kids on the old jungle gym or the rickety teeter-totter. Gage looks around to see if there's any cause for concern. All right, he tells me, but be back at Briggs's in one hour. Sasha and Linny are always complaining about how easily I find money. They don't get how they miss it, and I spot it every time. But it's not just the looking, it's how you look. When you first look down, you see everything, and nothing. It's as if your eyes can only see grayness. But if you tell yourself that there's treasure at your feet, your eyes will begin to see differences in the shades of gray. Silvery cracks, charcoal pebbles, ashy litter, then, when you find your first glimmering coin, your brain will understand exactly what you want, and it will start to find coins everywhere. It just takes patience. So once I start finding coins under the benches, at the bottom of the slide, and all around the busted water fountain, I don't want to stop. I look at my watch and see that 50 minutes have gone by, but I tell myself, just one more, then, okay, really, one more, and then absolutely, positively, just one more, promise. I look at my watch again. Holy moly, the whole hour has passed. I know I better hightail it back to Briggs. I race down the sidewalk and I'm about a block away from the apartment building when I see the airplane man and Amelia heading straight for me. Hi, I say. Amelia wriggles happily as I approach. I reach out my hand and brush it over her from the top of her head down her tickly back to the fur right before her tail. Ariana, right? The airplane man asks. I nod. I have something for you, he says, and reaches into his coat. He pulls out a paper airplane. It's long and sleek and much more elaborately folded than I expected. He holds it between his thumb and fingers on one hand so I can get a better look. I don't think I've ever seen a paper airplane that appears so real. Wow, thanks, I say. Then I realize that I don't actually know his name. Reggie, he says, seeming to read my mind. Thanks, Reggie, I say. The deep wrinkles around his eyes disappear as he smiles. Just then, something whizzes by us and ricochets off the side of the building, nearly hitting Amelia in the head. It's a chunk of brick. A big chunk. Get a job, a guy about Gage's age yells as he walks past. Did he, did he just throw a brick at us? I ask, shocked. 
Reggie shakes his head slowly. Not at us, at me. He leans down and holds Amelia's head in his hands, then looks in her eyes. Wonder how so much hate grows in a person that young. I'm so sorry, Reggie, I say, kicking the brick into the gutter. No sense worrying yourself about it, he says, straightening back up. I'm just glad you and Amelia didn't get hit. I nod and give Amelia one last pat. I've got to get going, I tell them, but thanks again for the plane. It's terrific. Reggie gives a little salute and I race back to the studio. I'm nearly there when I realize that I didn't even think to offer Reggie any of the change I collected today. Sure, I'd been searching extra hard to make up for the money I'd given him earlier this week, but the least I could have done would give him some of what I found today. After all, nobody was throwing bricks at my head and telling me to get a job. And maybe it's because I'm so distracted thinking about the brick and Reggie and Amelia and my plane and the money I'd collected, but when I enter Briggs's apartment and see Jana standing there, I'm not startled. Hi, I say my eyes hopping from Jana to Gage and back. There you are, she says, like we had an appointment or something. She has a scarf, scarf wrapped around her neck and she's leaning against the counter with her arms folded. Gage is standing over some boxes on the floor, boxes she must have brought. Chloe is nowhere in sight. So your brother lets you walk around the city on your own, huh? Jana asks in her judgy voice. I frown. I was just at the park around the corner and then I ran into, it, it's okay, Ari, Gage says. I told Jana where you were and that you wouldn't be gone long. Jana grunts and then looks around. So this is cute, she says, a sweep of her arm indicating the entire studio. And the decorations are certainly um, festive. And unless there's another room, I'm guessing you have to sleep here. Her judgy voice is back on big time. And where are all your things? Your boots and books and such, she's, she says, frowning at my wet and ratty shoes. And that's when it hits me. Jana thinks this is our place. Mine and Gage's. I try to catch Gage's eye to see if I'm supposed to play along, but he won't look at me. This is just temporary, Gage says, until we can find something better. Well, that's true, at least. Actually, says Jana, I'm surprised you were able to afford something in this building in the West End. You must have been squirreling away money your entire senior year. We're subletting, says Gage quickly. I watch Jana closely, wondering if she's buying this. Jana nods and walks around slowly, examining the objects in the room. Most of it is Briggs' crazy party supply stuff, but I notice that my Louisa May Alcott books are on the table, and my piggy bank has been taken down from on top of the cabinets and placed on the kitchen counter. I also notice that the place looks a lot cleaner than it usually does. No dishes in the sink or piled on the counter, no Cheerios or dust bunnies on the floor. Had Gage known that Jana was coming by? The decor is... interesting. Jana mutters, but the judgy tone is gone. And where do you hang your uniforms, Airy? I hear Gage's voice in my head. Jana rule number 124, always hang up your school uniform. I try to walk to the drawer under the TV set where I stuff them, that is, when they're not stuffed in my backpack or at Chloe's, but Gage slides over to the closet. In here, he says. He opens the one closet in the studio, the one that holds all of Briggs's work pants and dress shirts, as well as the worn costumes he brings home from one stop. But when Gage opens the closet, only his clothes and my clothes are hanging there, including clean uniforms. When had Gage thought to do that? It works, Jana says, and turns to look at me. She reaches a hand toward my face, but stops herself. Your hair looks very pretty today. I'd forgotten that it was in a gazillion French braids. You stayed at Sasha's last night, she says, her judgy voice back. Jana used to hate it when Mariana would do up my hair or sew a little flower onto my clothes. She thought it was Mariana's way of telling Jana that she was a better mother. 
I wanted to give Gage and Chloe a date night, I say, which is partly true. Well, Jana says, pulling on her coat, I'm glad you're doing so well. But she doesn't sound especially glad. This should be everything, she says, nodding at the boxes on the floor. Jana, I start before she makes it out the door. She turns, but I don't know what to say. Thanks for bringing my stuff, I blurt lamely. She nods and jets away. Chapter 12, Lunch Sacks. Ever since I can remember, I've had this theory that when each person is born, he or she is given an imaginary sack with the same number of happy moments, same number of horrible news moments, same number of please let me die now embarrassments. So while some people may have a bunch of bad moments all in a row, in the end, we all have experienced the same number of ups and downs. We'll all be even. Sasha tells me that that's a ridiculous way of thinking. Think of people who are starving or, or who live in countries where there is war or whose parents are divorced, she says. They suffer more. But I like to think that even these people whose hardships seem to come all at once might get to experience the same number of joys in their lives as someone else. And sometimes those feelings of joy pop up smack in the middle of hardship. And on the flip side, people whose lives seem perfect might also be suffering in ways we don't see or might face, face hardships down the road. But maybe Sasha is right. Maybe that is a ridiculous way of thinking. Yet sometimes when it feels like all my troubles are piling up, mama getting sick and dying, Jana and Gage fighting all the time, having to bounce from place to place with Gage and maybe missing out on the chance to go to Carter, it helps to think that there are only so many bad times in my sack, that sooner or later the good things will have to take over. Anyway, this is what I'm thinking about as Sasha, Linny, and I are going through the cashier line with our hot lunch trays. That is, Sasha and I are carrying trays. Linny brings her lunch to school, but she goes through the line with us because she hates sitting alone. When the cashier stops me and says that I don't have any money left in my account, tell your mom, dear, that she forgot to send in this month's check. Linny leans over. She doesn't have a... Sasha pulls Linny toward our table to shut her up. Today, I can give you an IOU, the cashier says, waving me through, but don't forget it tomorrow. It's not like Janet to forget to send the payment, Sasha says when I join them. She sounds like Mariana. Normally, Sasha's comment would make me smile, but my head is cloudy. It's the second day of April. Holy moly. I sip slightly warm milk through a straw and wonder about my empty lunch account. Jana never forgets first of the month responsibilities. Rule number 28, pay before play. I always knew when it was a new month because envelopes were on the counter, ready to be mailed envelopes with checks inside. Checks for bills, checks for school lunches and Girl Scout dues. And I'm no longer a girl, am I no longer a Girl Scout? Checks for the newspaper delivery man and the fresh market down uh, next door that lets us say, charge it please. No new balance means she's no longer paying for my hot lunches. Seeing Briggs' apartment must have convinced Jana that we're doing all right on our own, but we're not, not really. Until Gage finds a real job, he can't afford to pay for my lunches. What am I supposed to do? In the midst of my despair, another depressing thought hits me. April 2nd. That would have made yesterday April Fool's Day. I feel the long tug of missing. Missing the days when everyone at Eastland Elementary marched through the school hallway wearing crazy hats. Last year, Jana showed me a picture of my mother in elementary school wearing a homemade hat with wild pipe cleaner shapes zinging out in all directions and I made one just like it. Missing the days when Gage would play April Fool's jokes on me? One time he put salt in the sugar bowl and nearly fell over while he watched me take my first bite of oatmeal. 
missing the days when I didn't have to wonder where my next meal was coming from or where I was going to sleep each night or if Girl Scouts was no longer something I could put on my Carter application. That's what I'm pondering when Lenny says, GT Prowl, watch out! I look up and see Mademoiselle Barbary, our gifted and talented teacher, in the double doors of the cafeteria. I lower my head and take a bite of my tater tots. She's coming, says Sasha. I wish the approaching Mademoiselle were an April Fool's joke. When you're in kindergarten through third grade, being a GT kid is solid. You get to go to a special room and practice uh, and participate in projects like making a time capsule or learning French. But when you're in fourth and fifth grade, it means getting pulled away from your friends at lunchtime to discuss the unique problems of the gifted child. Lately, it's been even worse because I've fallen into the category of underachieving gifted child. Now I feel like she has her eyes on me all the time. What are your aspirations? Linny says, imitating Mademoiselle. I can't help myself. I look up. That's when Mademoiselle gives me a little come-with-me wave. Ugh. I say goodbye to my friends, pick up my tray, and follow her. Seven of us sit around the big wooden table in Mademoiselle Barbary's room today. Daniel, Sam, Gracie, and I have been put in this group since it started. She asks us, asks us if we are being appropriately challenged. I am, shoots out Daniel, who is sitting next to me. We all nod. We are, too. We learned last year that if you say that the work is too easy or that you're bored, you'll get tons more work to do, on top of the homework that the other kids get. I glance at the supplies on the shelves across the table. How I wish we could play with clay for a little while. Invent something, Mademoiselle Barbary used to say. Are you sure? She says now. I just looked over last quarter's grades and some of you are not living up to your potential. I look around the table wondering if she's addressing anyone other than me. Often bright kids don't do as well as they could when the subject matter isn't interesting, she adds in her I know how it is voice. Still no one speaks up. I start to feel sorry for her. Less than one quarter left and we'll no longer be students at Eastland, Gracie offers. It's hard to say whether she's suggesting that our gifted problems won't matter much in a couple months. After all, everyone's gifted at Carter, as Sasha likes to say. Or is she just stating a fact? But Mademoiselle is happy to run with it. How do you all feel about leaving Eastland? I've started a bucket list, says Daniel. A bucket list, Mason says. The things you want to do before you die? No, not that. This is a list of things I want to do before I leave Eastland, says Daniel. Mademoiselle presses her hands together like she's saying a prayer. Excellent. Tell us one thing on your list. Daniel pulls a small notebook the size of a passport out of his back pocket and thumbs through it. There seem to be lots of lists and some sketches, too. He finds the page he was looking for. Talk to one person at Eastland that I've never spoken to. Magnifique, Mademoiselle says. She reaches for paper and suggests we each make a list and share them the next time we get together. Usually we come up with all sorts of excuses for not doing the extra tasks Mademoiselle assigns us, but for some reason everyone seems really excited by the list idea, shouting out stuff they'd put on their list. I lean over and ask Daniel if he's picked the person he'll talk to. He shakes his head and pushes his little notebook over so I can read the whole list. One, talk to one person at Eastland that I've never spoken to. Two, jump from the top of the bleachers into the pile of gym mats. Three, free Gerald. <laughs> I laugh after reading number three. Everyone at Eastland knows about Ms. Finch's turtle, Gerald even if they don't have Miss Finch. She's had him forever, and he's grown so much that he almost doesn't fit in his tank. Everyone's just a little afraid of Gerald, even though he's not a snapper. Even Miss Finch is afraid of him, which is why his tank is dirty all the time. Number four, 
cover the halls with paper snowflakes. I realize that I'm not the only one missing the Eastland traditions. I grab Daniel's pencil and write while wearing a crazy hat after this item. He smiles. I continue reading. Number five, get everyone to sing kindergarten songs in the cafeteria. Number six, skid from one end of the math hall to the other after Mr. Grogan polishes the floor. Seven, eight, how come seven and eight are blank, I whisper. Mademoiselle glances at us. He points at the paper to keep me reading. Number nine, be brave. Number 10, persuade Ariana Hazard to do numbers one through nine with me. I look up and give him my you've got to be kidding look. He takes back his pencil and writes, you can fill in seven and eight. <laughs> no way, I mouth. Then he writes, you might only go to four more schools in your whole lifetime. That's only four last days ever. I think about that for a moment. I reach for the pencil and write, that's if I go to college. He writes, of course you'll go to college. I force a smile, though what I'm thinking is that I might not if I don't get into Carter. I'll think about it, I write. Daniel smiles and crosses off numbers 9 and 10. Chapter 13, Invitations. Gage picks me up from Head Start and calls Briggs. Hey, Briggster, he says, what's up? I know he's hoping that Briggs will tell us to come by tonight. While he talks, I travel in ever widening circles on the sidewalk looking for pennies. The conversation drags on, but still no invitation. Gage tries harder. So, do you have any plans tonight? And then Gage's voice gets louder. You're kidding. He can't do that, can he? Are you going to listen to him? All right, he says. Yeah, sure. I understand. No studio tonight, I say when he gets off the phone. Briggs's landlord said he's been violating the lease, that three people are living in the apartment instead of just one. But we're not living there. So now I'm as mad as Gage. You and I know that, but tell it to the landlord. Does that mean we're never going back? I want to ask him what we'll do about the stuff we left there, our clothes and the boxes from Jana, but now doesn't seem like the time. No, says Gage. He starts walking to where, I don't know, but I follow. It just means that we have to be a lot more scarce. Chloe's? I ask hopefully when we get to the bus stop. Gage shakes his head. She has a friend from out of town staying with her tonight. Lighthouse? I say, less hopefully. I hope not, says Gage, and boards the bus. As it turns out, we're staying with Perry and Kristen. Gage met Perry down at the docks, and Kristen is his wife, even though they are hardly any older than Gage. Right now we're sitting in their living room in Southport, which is not really in Port City. It's a whole different town, miles and miles from my school. I tried to decide where I should sit. There are two options, a big nubby couch with an orange and green throw on it and an easy chair. There's plenty of room on the couch next to Perry, but Kristen, who is in the other room and who probably looks pretty when she's happier, is none too pleased about having guests so I'd hate to take any of her comfiness. I try to decide if she's more of an easy chair person or a couch person. I can imagine her stretching out on the couch with one of her cats. I've counted three so far, the blanket covering her legs, but maybe she'd prefer the solitude of the easy chair since she doesn't seem to want to be near Perry right now. I wish I could just go into the other room and do my schoolwork, but we're not the kind of overnight guests where the hosts announce, make yourself at home. We're practically strangers here. Gage sizes up the situation and grabs a metal chair from the kitchen table. He brings it into the living room and nods for me to sit on the couch next to Perry. I sit on the far end of the couch, trying to make myself smaller, cuter, cat-like. 
Kristen comes into the room and takes the easy chair. I can't tell if she's mad about that or not. Perry hands the remote to Gage, but Gage passes it off to, Kir to Kristen and says, We're happy to watch whatever you like. Perry snorts, Don't do that, man, he says, which seems to make Kristen even more annoyed. In fact, I kind of wonder if Perry brought us home just to aggravate Kristen. Kristen tosses the remote back in Perry's lap. When we walked in the back door, Kristen had been seated at the kitchen table. She pounced, expecting only Perry, wanting to know why he was late. Her face tightened when he introduced us, a look I recognized from Jana, who tried really hard not to look like an evil stepmother when we broke the 48-hour rule and brought friends home unannounced, and said that we needed to play a place to crash tonight, that we'd thought we could move into our apartment today, but hadn't been ready after all. That's the sort of thing Gage tells people so they don't think we're homeless. Which we're not, of course. We're just between homes. What about dinner? Kristen had asked. Perry had handed her the leftover pizza from Flatbread where we'd gone after meeting up. Flatbread is a tray big treat for us, and I thought Kristen might be pleased, but I guessed she mostly felt left out. Anyway, it was a bad start to what was turning out to be a bad night. Perry turns on a basketball game. I stare at a spot on my blouse where I spilled tomato sauce. Since all of my extra shirts are at Briggs, I'll have to wear this same top tomorrow. I don't dare ask Kristen and Perry if I can use their washing machine. I don't even know if they have one. But think maybe the stain will come out in the sink. May I use your bathroom? I ask. Use the one upstairs, said Kristen. It's cleaner. On the way up the stairs, I grab my backpack. I lock the bathroom door and take my sweater and my blouse off. I turn on the water and wet the stain on my blouse. I look around for soap, but I can't find any. I look in the shower and see a small bottle of shampoo. It's green. I wonder if it will turn my white blouse green. I decide to take the chance. It doesn't, but it doesn't exactly take the tomato sauce out either. It just sort of fades it. I put the blouse back on and button my sweater up over the wet spot. Maybe the stain will fade even more once it's dry. I'm on the landing about to head back downstairs when Kristen comes up the stairs. Do you want to sleep in the cupola? She asks. I look to my left and my right. There's one bedroom on each side of the landing. One with a big bed and men's clothes hanging over a chair is that's clearly theirs. The other one has a twin bed, and I figure that's the guest room. I point to the guest room. Is that the cupola? No, dummy, she says, but not in a mean way. Follow me. Using a metal rod that was resting against the wall, she opens a trap door in the ceiling, and a folding ladder comes down. I climb the ladder nervously. I definitely don't want to sleep in an attic, but I don't feel comfortable telling Kristen this. But when we get to the top, I see that it's not an attic at all. It's a tiny rooftop room with windows on all four sides, like the top of a lighthouse. There's a padded window seat all around that's wide enough to sleep on. The sun has set, but I can see street lights and house lights below me. This was my grandmother's house, Kristen said. I used to come up and sleep up here all the time. She sits down on the edge of the seat. Sometimes I still do. It's like being on top of the world, I say, looking over rooftops. My grandmother told me th that before there were all these street lights, you could see stars from up here. Then she looks at me. It must be hard not having your own bed. I shrug. I'm okay as long as I'm with Gage, I say, and sit down beside her. She nods. He seems nice, like the kind of guy who's considerate. I want to tell her that as great as Gage is, sometimes we fight. But before I can say anything, she says, Perry used to be really considerate. That's when I realize that Kristen isn't mean. She's just sad and maybe lonely. Want to see something, I say? Sure, she says in a polite voice. I think maybe she just doesn't want to head back downstairs yet. I pull my paper things folder out of my backpack to show her. 
She clicks on an overhead light so she can see better. You've cut out lots of pretty things, she says, handling my paper things like they're made of tissue. Imagine having a jewelry box like this one, she says, holding up the bureau with skinny little drawers. It's called an accessory tower, I tell her. I used to make beaded jewelry like the bracelet in this drawer. How come you stopped? Kristen shrugs. Perry and I got married to be a family. Then I lost a baby. I haven't been able to do much, but think about it. I don't know what to say, and so I do what every well-meaning person who tried to cheer me up after Mama died did. I say something stupid. Maybe if you started making things again, you could buy one of these towers. Kristen smiles. Before the docks, Perry was learning woodworking. Maybe he'd build me one. She sighs and closes my folder. I wonder if I've made her sadder. Be sure to turn the light off before you get undressed, she says, standing up and walking toward the ladder. There aren't any shades up here. As Kristen creaks down the ladder, I pull out one of my Louisa May Alcott books. I find my place and read farther, taking a few notes in my notebook. I learned that Louisa May Alcott was poor, just like the characters in Little Women. She wrote that story to try to earn some money to help her family out. I wish there was something I could do to help Gage and me. Something other than collecting pennies, I mean. I also learned that Louisa liked to keep lists. She wrote one about the bad habits she wanted to give up. Idleness, willfulness, impudence, pride, and love of cats. Love of cats? I wonder what Kristen would say about that. I wonder what impudence means. I wonder if I have it. The list makes me think of Daniel's bucket list. I'm certainly not going to help him with it, even though I do like the idea of bringing back the snowflakes, but I think I understand what made him write it. As much as I'm looking forward to going to Carter, assuming I still have a shot at getting in, it's hard to imagine leaving Eastland Elementary. I think back on the teachers I've had over the years, the classrooms that were mine. I think about upcoming graduation. Last year, Mason and I got to be marshals at graduation, chosen because of our grades. That meant that I carried a baton and led the fifth graders into the gym. The principal called each graduating student up to the podium after his or her name was announced like Sasha's older brother, William Sortskin, son of Alphonse and Mariana Sortskin. Who will they announce for my parents? Mama and dad, even though they're both dead? Jana, who I'm not even sure is still planning to come to graduation? Or will they just say Ariana Hazard, sister of Gage Hazard? I close my notebook and as I repack my backpack, I notice the paper airplane Reggie gave me the other day. I pull it out and examine it more closely. It's made of newspaper and it has wings that look as graceful and as pretty as a bird's. Headlines fold in and out of the plane like ribbons with a secret code. I read the broken words to see if they create an interesting message, one for only me. They don't seem to, but I do notice the word jiffy which gives me pause for some re reason. What does this word jiffy remind me of? I unfold the jiffy wing one crease at a time, making sure I remember how to put the plane back together. Printed inside the wing is an ad for Jiffy Lube, and now I remember. Jiffy Lube was the name of the garage where Gage might be able to get a job. Slowly, I trace the word jiffy with my ink smudged finger and then fold the airplane back up. Whether Reggie meant it or not, I can't help feeling that this really is a secret message. I try to open the window. At first it sticks, but I lean in using my whole body to lift the frame. It pops open and lets the cool April air stream in. I hold the plane, this intricate gift made just for me between my fingertips. I have so few things of my own, but I'm thinking of wishes, wishes made on shooting stars, dandelion puffs, the flame of a birthday candle. 
all those wishes floating off on the wind. I close my eyes and imagine Gage telling me he got a job. I imagine our own apartment with a room just for me, my own window, my own bed, a place for my paper things. I look at that word on that wingtip one more time, then I pull the plane back to my shoulder and let it fly. Please, I whisper to the wind, please. Chapter 14, Notes. I'm sitting in Mr. O's language arts class and I can hear Keisha talking with Sasha behind me. Keisha's one of the popular girls and I can't remember the last time she talked to me or Sasha. Her voice is just loud enough for me to hear. Is Ari using some new product in her hair or is that grease? I try hard to hear Sasha's response. Is she sticking up for me? But how can she? What can she say? She has no idea that I no longer have to pass the Jana test every single morning before heading out the door. But this morning, Gage and I overslept and I hardly had time to brush my hair before catching the bus back into Port City and all the way to Eastland. It seems like I have to wash it every day now to keep it clean. Plus, I had to throw on the same blouse that had the stain on it, so even though Mr. O's room is a furnace, I have my sweater buttoned up tight. I tuck the greasiest strand of hair, the one that falls over my forehead, behind my ear, and I try to focus on my work. We're supposed to be writing book responses on books we've read on our own, our independent reading, as Mr. O calls it, and I'm writing mine on the Louisa May Alcott bio I was reading last night at Kristen and Perry's. I wonder if Mr. O will think I'm cheating, making a book do double duty. But as much as I love to read, one book is all I've had time for lately. She smells, too, Linny says from behind Keisha. Linny, who can't resist being part of any conversation that Sasha's involved in. Is she joking? I put my head down a little lower, trying to smell my pits. She's not joking. I stink. I curl over my desk, folding my arms in as close to my body as I can. How could I help it? Gage phone, Gage's phone died, so we didn't have an alarm. We woke late, dressed, grabbed our things, and raced out the door. The bus stop was practically a whole mile away from where we slept last night. Gage kept screaming at me, hurry up, Airy, run faster. I was running as fast as I could, but my shoe has started to flap where the stitching is coming out and it falls off easily. We made our first bus, but it was so crowded that Gage and I couldn't sit together. I had to sit next to a woman who kept sighing because she'd had two seats to herself and now she had to hold her things on her lap and she didn't have much lap. When we got to Congress Street, where our first bus route ended, Gage realized that we'd used up our bus passes. He'd have to go to an ATM to get more money to buy new ones. I can't wait here, I shouted at Gage. If I'm late again, I'll get detention. What are your choices, Airy? Gage had snapped back. I'm running, I said. We've run up to East End plenty of times from here before. Then go, he yelled at me. Those were the last words we spoke to each other this morning. So it's not much of a surprise that I don't look or smell my best today. But I can't very well explain the situation to Sasha and the others. My eyes start to tear and I pinch myself on the thigh to give myself something else to focus on. Mr. O stops by Sasha's, Keisha's, and Linny's desks. Are you three reading the same book by any chance? Mr. O asks them. It's his way of telling them to get back to work. I'm glad. Maybe now Sasha knows what it feels like for your teacher to be disappointed in you, even though she still has three weeks left as patrol leader. I ignore Sasha and Linny as much as I can all morning, which turns out not to be such a good idea. It seems to just make them higher and mightier. When the lunch bell rings, they're huddled together in front of Sasha's locker, whispering and shooting me looks. 
I can't tell if they're working up enough courage to tease me or if they're planning a hygiene intervention, the way Sasha and I once held an intervention to try to get Lenny to talk more softly, which, by the way, did not work. Either way, I'm smart enough to recognize a gang up. I'm also smart enough to devise a, to devise a plan for avoiding them during lunch period. While we were madly rushing around this morning, Kristen wrapped the leftover pizza in foil and stuffed it in my backpack. And even though I was hungry on the bus, I saved it. Since I don't have any money in my account anyway, and since I'd rather not be ambushed by Linny and my supposed best friend, I figure I'll just skip the cafeteria altogether. Instead, I ask Mr. O for permission to stay in the classroom during lunch and work on my report. You know I usually don't allow it, he says, but I'll say yes today. You're going to need all the time you can get. I gobble my pizza. When I dig deeper into my backpack to retrieve my notebook, I notice two things. One, an orange, a big, beautiful orange wedged between my binders. Two, a short note. What's number seven and eight? Daniel. I wonder if he's noticed that I'm not at my best today. I wonder if he cares that my hair is gross and I smell like the boys after a volleyball game. Maybe tonight we'll be at Chloe's and I can shower and send Gage to the laundromat. I think about Daniel's bucket list as I start to peel the orange. I can't seem to come up with anything I want to do one last time at Eastland before going to middle school, and I wonder what that says about me. I think of other places I've left. If I'd known for longer than a day that I would be leaving Jana's, for example, what would I have wanted to do? And just like that, I know. I would have crawled into the corner of the closet, smelled the cedar chips that Jana put in there to keep the moths away, and found that little stuffed hedgehog that everyone thought was one of my toys when they moved us out of Mama's apartment but really was a toy for Leroy, our dog. When we first went to live with Jana, I would take the comforter off my bed and drag it into the closet with me, along with the hedgehog. I liked sleeping in that small space, hidden away from everybody, from Jana, from the social worker, even from Gage. I was in second grade when Mama died. Every day, Jana would bring me to school and leave me in the reading corner of Ms. Rich's classroom, where I'd curl up in a beanbag chair and read. Ms. Rich just let me stay there as long as I wanted. When I'd read every book in the reading corner, she began to place books from the library near the beanbag. Eventually, the books got longer, fatter, and juicier, until I was spending most of the day on that beanbag chair, lost in imaginary worlds. But then one Monday morning, Jana dropped me off, and instead of making my way to the reading corner, I headed for my desk. I don't know what had changed, but somehow I felt ready to rejoin the class. While I was adjusting to being back at school, the guidance counselor came to Mrs. Ms. Rich's room once a week and brought me down to her office. She'd ask me questions about Mama and Gage, about living with Jana, She'd ask how I was feeling and if I'd cried. I don't think I did cry much that year. Maybe that's why I'm so leaky now. Inside the guidance office, there was a dollhouse. I longed to play with that dollhouse, to move the family members from room to room, discovering all the little treasures. It would be like a 3D version of my paper things. But the counselor never said I could play with it and I was always too afraid to ask. I can feel a huge laugh rising through my body. I pull out Daniel's note and write, seven, sneak into the guidance office and play with the toys. And then I realize how foolish this would be to say nothing of babyish. It's all fine and good to sneak around the school doing things you're not supposed to if you're Daniel and you don't care if you go to Carter or not. He has said as much in the presence of Mademoiselle Barbary many times, but I do care. So I pull out a slip of paper and write, Dear Daniel, thank you for the orange. It was delicious. 
I have given your proposal serious thought and here is what I've concluded. I can't do all the items with you because of the risk of getting caught. It's, that's too high. But I have thought of two activities for numbers seven and eight. And if you'll do those, I'll do two of the other items with you, okay? Number seven, help Ariana Hazard get a leadership role. Eight, help Ariana Hazard apply to Carter. Signed, Ari. I pop the last bite of orange into my mouth and tuck the note into Daniel's desk. Chapter 15, Maps. Here is the greatest thing about Head Start. Little kids don't care if your hair is greasy or if you smell a little bit. Though I hope that the paper towel and soap bath I gave myself between science and social studies helped with that. During circle time, four-year-old Omar will still leap into your folded lap. He will lean his head against your collarbone so you can soak in the smell of his hair. Not a baby shampoo smell, but a spicy cooking and hard dreaming smell. He will trace his finger up and down your hand like a Hot Wheels on a racetrack, never noticing the dirtiness of your fingernails, the grime at your wrist caused by drying orange juice and lead pencil smudges. Or if he does, he won't care about those things. He will lean into you and pull your arms around him so that you feel like the best and most important person in the world. Omar and I are wrapped up together listening to Fran read about the gopher that wants his hat back when West slips into the classroom to talk with Carol. I've never seen West at Head Start before, even though he was the one who told me that Carol and Fran needed a helper, and I can't help wondering if he's here because of me. Sure enough, Carol comes over and tells me that West would like to speak with me. Omar is none too happy about this, but Carol offers to take my place, and Omar grudgingly agrees. Hey, kiddo, West says, rubbing the stubble on his chin. Though he's older than Gage, West is still pretty young, younger than any of my teachers. At Lighthouse, the kids are always trying to get his attention, especially the girls. I pull my arms in closer in case the paper towel bath didn't do the trick. I haven't seen you engage lately, he says. Everything okay? For some reason, his question makes my lip tremble. I bite on it, hoping he didn't notice. No such luck. Come out here, he says gently, leading me into the front hall where the kids' pussy willow pictures lean down to listen. I shouldn't have let on that anything's wrong. It's West, Gage says, who's keeping me out of the foster care system, keeping the two of us together. He understands how hard Gage is working to find us an apartment, and he knows Gage is doing the best he can for me, for us. Things are okay, I say, trying to sound more optimistic like Gage. We've been staying with our friend Briggs. I don't mention Perry and Kristen or even Chloe. I want West to think we're fine. Yeah, he says. Where's that? In the West End, I smile. West and West. He gets it and he smiles too. Must be good then. How's Gage doing on the job hunt? Hey man, I look up. It's my brother. He's wearing his interview outfit. Black pants, a clean white shirt, and a sport coat that Briggs had loaned him. He's clean shaven too. When did he find the time to shower and change? And since when did he have an interview today? You're early, I skip over to hang on his arm, happy to see him and relieved not to have to answer any more of West's questions. Aren't you looking dapper, West says. Just came from a job interview. Gage looks serious and I start to squeeze his arm to console him, but suddenly he breaks into a grin. I got it. I start at Jiffy Lube tomorrow morning. I let out a little yelp of happiness and throw my arms around my big brother. You didn't tell me you were interviewing there today, I ask. My voice was muffled by his sport coat. I would have spent every spare minute sending you good luck vibes. I didn't want you to get your hopes up, Beniti, 
he tells me, ruffling my dirty hair. I didn't know you were, you were mechanically inclined, says West. Some. I used to own a car, a beater that I worked on all the time, but they train, too. Gage's old car had been ugly as sin, covered in patches and four colors of paint. Jana had hated having it parked in front of the house, and I think she was hoping it would up and die one day. But Gage always managed to figure out what was going on with it and find a way to make it work again. I still remember the day Jana took the car away. The night before, someone had called Jana and told her that Gage was one of the teenagers spotted at a house party across town. She'd been furious when she hung up the phone and had ordered me to get in her car, even though I was already in my pajamas. I got in the back seat and we drove around in the dark until we found the house, down a long dirt road, but we didn't go inside. Jana just took the tire iron out of her trunk and removed his back wheel. I'd heard them arguing the next morning. It was what they call a knockdown, drag out fight, their worst ever. Gage had had to walk home. He'd been the designated driver for the evening and had spent half the night scrambling to, refine, to find replacement rides for his friends who'd been drinking. But Jana didn't focus on how responsible Gage had been. Instead, she screamed at him for attending a party with alcohol in the first place and for letting his friends get drunk. You're just like your father, she shouted, making it sound like the worst insult ever. Gage had said some pretty nasty things back at that point, which was when Jana called Joe's salvage and had them tow his car away. Even if Gage could have figured out where she'd stashed the missing tire, he didn't have the money to get it out of the impound, so that was the end of Gage's ugly car. But now Gage will be working on lots of cars, and maybe he can even save up enough money to buy one of his own, not to mention he can now afford to pay rent. We will finally have our own apartment, our own beds, and our own shower. Sasha, Linny, and Keisha won't have any reason to gossip about me then. When I go to say goodbye to Omar and the others, I feel like I'm walking on air. How funny to think that a day that started off so terrible could turn into one of the best days ever. That's the end of chapter 15. Come join me next week. We'll read more of the book Paper Things.